just relaxed and paid attention. Tell them, tell them, you tell them. Oh, gosh, I haven't heard the fifth dimension in 127 years. Boy, we used to twist the night away <laughs> with those guys. All right, welcome back to 21st Century Radio. I'm Dr. Bob Hieronymus, and my executive producer and research assistant is Laura Cordner, and our engineer is Anita Brockington. What a nice name, Anita Brockington. Okay. Well, our guest, of course, is Dr. Mark Carlotto. We're talking about Before Atlantis, his new book, New Evidence Suggesting the Existence of a Previous Technological Civilization on Earth. You can order it. All links are at 21stCenturyRadio.com, of course, but you can find it online at www.BeforeAtlantis.com. Well, we got a lot of questions to ask you, sir. Are you sitting up straight? I'm sitting up straight. Good going. Eyes are straight ahead, and there's no... T- you can chew gum. We can allow you to chew gum. Is that okay? As long as I don't have to do anything else, I can do that. Oh, good going. All right. Now, <laughs> <laughs> um, how do you use pole shifts to date archaeology? Oh, no, we talked about that. That's no, right. actually, actually, you know, I gave you a very long-winded answer. <laughs> I never got to the punchline. Oh, that's what my boss told me. Okay. Because the answer, the answer, the answer was actually real simple. So I thought, oh, let me give you the long answer. But um, so the short answer is, uh, Hapgood basically dated the poles using climate data. So if you know the date of the poles, then the date of the sites al- aligned to the pole would be uh, the same as the date of the poles. So in other words, if the um, sites aligned to the Hudson Hudson Bay Pole w- would, based on our chronology could have been built between, say, 20 and 60,000 years ago. Sites aligned to the Norwegian Sea, po- Norwegian sea Pole could have been built 60 to 80,000 years ago. Sites aligned to the Greenland Pole between 80 and 130,000 years ago, and to the Bering Sea Pole even older than that, so 130,000 years plus. So it's the date of the poles uh, gives you the date of the sites, the at least the time frame. Well... As above, so below. I love that saying. How is this old adage of as above, so below, the literal application of using astronomy to understand and date archaeology? Yeah, it's, it's, it's perfect. It's the idea that, that these uh, archaeological uh, sites contain structures, uh, these sacred sites. They're not really, uh, it's archaeology to us, but at the time they were sacred sites. And they were built as representations of, of the heavens to reflect the heavens. And you can speculate on, on the purpose. Uh, you know, some believe it was, uh, it was an, uh, because, because there were aliens and it was, you know, they, this could only be appreciated and perceived from above. You know, we talk about things like the Nazca lines, for example. Um, and, you know, I don't really get into that in the book because I like to kind of stick to what I know. And I, you know, I don't know about that, and I, I don't think anyone really does. Um, but in terms of, you know, what we find um, close by, and, and I live in New England. We have a site here called uh, Mystery Hill. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, and, and um, you know, and, and it's, it's, it's clear that um, it was uh, the Native people um, cared about the seasons, and uh, they cared about when uh, summer was here and winter and so forth, and uh, they marked them with with uh, because they knew they they followed the motion of the sun, and um, and we find this throughout the world. Uh, so it's clearly a human tendency, whether it's for a specific purpose uh, as a calendar, or whether it's ceremonial or uh, purely artistic. Um, there's there's uh, there's an awareness of of the sky and the motion of the of the uh, sun and the moon and the stars and a and a need to express that in archaeology and I'm sorry in in architecture and um, I think this is an important this is you know this is what the whole idea of archaeoastronomy is about it's exploiting this for the purpose of understanding the sites of you know why they were aligned why the people aligned a site to the sun or the moon or to a star and then based on the alignments when uh, the site was built because um, 
things change. Stars move. Uh, the Earth's, uh, uh, you know, due to precessional changes and changes in Earth's obliquity, the tilt of our axis. What was the summer solstice uh, 4,000 years ago is, is different now. And, um, and based on these slight changes, it's only a couple of degrees in angle. Uh, we know based on, uh, say, the alignments at Stonehenge, the heel stone alignment to the summer solstice sunrise, that based on uh, the misalignment today, it was built probably, you know, at a, at a time when uh, archaeologists uh, believe that it was. You know, it's, it supports the, the um, uh, forget it, Stonehenge, Stonehenge 4, or there's a number of phases. But, um, you know, it's uh, archaeology can uh, can often support um, other means of dating, uh, but it can also uh, come up with dates that uh, deviate from uh, you know conventional thinking. And uh, you know this was the problem when Lockyer, uh, Norman Lockyer, mm. uh, first analyzed alignments in Egypt using stars. He came up with dates that were much older than Egyptologists, uh, the archaeologists yeah. at the time. Uh, wanted and so he his work was totally marginalized That's and you know, well not marginalized but it was, it wasn't ignored it was, a, it was actually criticized and it turned off egyptologists the whole idea of using uh stellar uh, dating uh alignments to date sites uh until up to the current uh present time so what are the results of your new dating. How old, say, is Machu Picchu and, or the Acropolis, or I can't even pronounce, Teo, top, Teo, Teo, Teotihuacan. Yes, you got it. Okay. Okay, so the Acropolis um, is, uh, you know, the, the, the conventional explanation for the Acropolis, it's, it's not aligned to the cardinal directions, it's rotated. And the belief is that it was rotated to be to line up to the direction of the sun on Athena's birthday. Athena is the pa is the patron goddess of Athens. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like, okay, that makes sense. But you know, if you think about it, you know, how do we know when Athena was born? I mean, she's a, a goddess, right? Who really knows this? No. Um, it turns out that the Acropolis is lined up. It points to the Greenland Pole. So another explanation that I propose in the book is that um, the Acropolis was built, you know, 85 to 130,000 years ago. It's Whoa, incredibly boy. ancient. Yeah. Well, I don't I actually see. I'm not talking about the physical Parthenon because you can look at that and say that can't possibly be yeah, that old. Yeah. But the Parthenon is actually built on an on a structure below it. And this and you find this at, in other uh, many other sites that they're built on top of older structures. But the Acropolis, the, the, the landform itself, I believe, could go back to 130,000 years ago. And so the explanation I favor is that the, uh, the site was laid out at that time, and then it was co-opted by the Greeks. They're, you know, the Greeks moved in with their gods or their versions of earlier gods, um, which could have been Egyptian gods in many cases. Uh, but they decided, okay, the sun rises on this date, uh, in line with the with uh, the Parthenon with with, with these uh, foundations, and so this is Athena's birthday. So it was sort of a post facto thing. They <laughs> they made it up after the fact. That that I think is a more plausible explanation, uh, as opposed to, you know, how do you know when Athena's birthday was? That's well, there's no, anyway, there's no so way to know so that. that. Okay. So that's the Parthenon, uh, Machu Picchu, even older, uh, older than 130,000 years ago. Mm. Not saying necessarily that that structure there is that old, but that that site was laid out. That part of the site, which is aligned in a different direction than the lower part of Machu Picchu, where the uh, residences are located and are built out of much cruder field stones. These stones um, at the upper part of Machu Picchu are made of you know, pre 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 precision, uh, you know, uh, granite that, uh, that fits together uh, with, you know, no space between, you know, we've, we've probably talked about this with other authors, uh, this incredible me megalithic technology that existed. Um, so that, that site would be even older. Um, and uh, Teotihuacan um, in Mexico, north of Mexico City, aligned to the Hudson Bay Pole between 20 and 60,000 years ago. So just those are examples of sites, but there are, there are hundreds of others and, and uh, you know, they're all uh, what 
as of uh, you know a few months ago when when the final uh, the last edition was put together, um, there's a listing of probably about 120 sites or so. Um, but there's more now that are lined up to prior polls. And the list continues to grow as we go into more areas. And I talk about this on, on the website. The latest article uh, is called Ruins in the Stands. And I look at, um, at uh, the ruins of uh, what looked to be a, a lost civilization in Central Asia, in the stands, Turkmenistan, uh, Uzbekistan, those places that are, you know, uh, places that are, you know, off, off the map, off, certainly off the beaten trail these days. Mm-hmm. Um, for years, they were on along the old Silk Roads, but uh, I argue in this uh, latest article in the po- in, that I posted that um, based on their alignments, they could uh, any which could go back twenty to sixty thousand years ago. Why do they keep building new monuments in the same places? This, I I don't know the answer to that, but uh, in the archaeology archae um, in the archaeology literature, there are uh, many precedents and observations that uh, there are um, there are, 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 are patterns of cultivation uh, that are aligned uh, in, along directions that were established in pre, say in in, mm-hmm. in uh, Mexico, yeah. uh, established in pre-Columbian times, and that certain patterns just sort of are you, once something once a pattern's established, you just kind of follow it. If your fields are laid out in a certain direction, just kind of just keep working them that way. If you have a building um, that you're renovating, rather than tear the whole thing down, which is actually what we do now, but in ancient times, megalithic sites appear to be uh, built on older sites that have the same uh, the same orientation. Uh, Baalbek, the Temple of Jupiter in Lebanon, uh, is built again on top of an earlier foundation. Why? Because it was easier. It's probably easier, you know, to, for the Romans to do that mm-hmm. than to, you know, knock down a site that had, you know, stones weighing hundreds of tons. Hundreds. Yeah. You know, so you just sort of take what you start, you know, what you what you, what you have to begin with, and you build on top of it. And this seems to be a pattern that we find. Um, Throughout the world, in, in Mexico, there are pyramids built over pyramids over pyramids. Pyramid, to, yeah. In, in um, Mexico City, uh, Templo Mayar is a pyramid that is built, uh, current, the latest pyramid that was built by the Aztecs were built over previous, uh, earlier versions of the pyramid that I think were on a site that had been established not in the time of the Aztecs or any of the, um, uh, the, uh, the people, uh, the Nuatl uh, people, um, which would be historical or, you know, pre-Columbian, but certainly historical based on what's recorded in, in their codices, but from a time in, uh, in far antiquity, uh, back between uh, 80 and 130,000 years ago. Uh, because again, t- uh, Temple of Maiar, as is much of Mexico city is aligned in the direction of the Greenland pole. There's no other plausible explanation for why it should be aligned this way. Mm-hmm. Archaeologists present some arguments, but they 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 really don't hold water there. They, in fact, a, a site as as uh, monumental as Teotihuacan, which is aligned to the Hudson Bay Pole, north of Mexico City, there's really no good explanation, despite, you know, years and years of archaeological research. There's a lot of theories, but they they're they they're very qualitative. And it's like, um, you need a, a much more compelling explanation, I think, to explain such a monumental. It's a vast site. It's big, you know, it's mm-hmm. it's as impressive as the pyramids uh, on the Giza plateau. It's really spectacular. Uh, and we own, we know that you know how they were laid out with such precision, and they they're actually laid out to the cardinal directions, which is kind of interesting, um, which suggests that they're much more recent than some of these other structures. Wow, you mentioned we're talking about Mexico here. On page 87, excuse me, we got to take a break? Oh, I'm awfully sorry. Okay, we're going to get to William Niven. Why did he believe Mexico was the cradle for the human race? That was fascinating to me uh, because I've heard that before from Chinese people. Okay, so we're going to take this break. 
on 21st Century Radio with Dr. Mark Carlotto. We'll be back in a few minutes. This is Carl Lerberger, author of Secrets of Ancient America, www.newhistoryofamerica.com. And I invite you to continue listening to 21st Century Radio with Dr. Bob Hieronymus. Well, welcome back with our guest, Dr. Mark Carlotto. Are you still there, Mark? I'm here, Bob. Uh, are you twisting the night away and having a good time? I'm good. 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 All right. Now, the next question I have for you is William Nevin, and I lost him. It's number 9A. William <laughs> William Nevin, Niven, why did he believe Mexico was the cradle of the human race, or did he just suggest it might have been? Well, he was a he was a mineral mineralogist who went to Mexico uh, to find, you know, he had clients that would pay him to find certain uh, rare, precious minerals. Um. And so he spent much of his professional life digging in Mexico. Um, in southern Mexico, he found ruins of a of a, of what he believed was an ancient civilization. It took years for uh, people to sort of retrace his steps and find what he had found. And there's a um, one of my friends, Marco Vigato, has a great uh, blog uh, called uh, Uncharted Ruins. Uh, and he talks about Niven's, well, his discoveries on uh, following up on Niven's earlier discoveries in southern Mexico. But what, uh, to your question, um, what Niven found in the Valley of Mexico, this is around Mexico City, was he, he was digging for artifacts. And so digging down, you find, you know, this, this, the, um, the different layers, the, the stratigra stratigraphic layers of sediment that, you know, reveal uh, changes that have taken place over a period of time. And uh, he, uh, what he determined was that at the lowest level uh, where he was digging, there were some really major changes, like volcanic activity and uh, something, something very old having been buried. And he called what was buried at the deepest level, below this level of uh, volcanic material, um, a buried city, and if you look at his, uh, uh, if you look at his stri uh, stratigraphy, there are different uh, layers that can be correlated with, say, the period when the Aztecs were in the Valley of Mexico, and then prior to that, there were the, the Teo Teotihuacanos, and so on. And, and then there's this earlier phase that um, was called the, um, um, uh, oh, what's the term that he used? I can't recall the term. But um, he believed that there was a, a cataclysm that, that wiped out uh, an, unknown, uh, an unknown civilization in that part of the world. Mm -hmm. um, and this comes at a time when others were, were very interested in, in, in uh, Mesoamerica. This is around the time when um, uh, Churchward had written The Lost Continent of Mu and when Augustus Le Plégeon had written... Uh, uh, Queen um, Queen Mu and the Egyptian Sphinx. He was uh, an ethnographer and uh, a photographer. Spent a lot of time in the Yucatan, and he believed that the Mayans were a very, very old uh, civilization. And so, putting all this together, um, and, and actually, uh, we're, I'm sort of backing into this. This is uh, this is where before Atlantis in my book, where I kind of lead you to where I think the best evidence is to support um, if there was a place called, called Atlantis, that it would have been somewhere uh, in this part of the world because it fits the data really well. Uh, but because of its connectedness with other things that I believe were going on at the time, I don't believe Atlantis was just a single place in time, but was much more, much more of like, a, can we perhaps call it a world pre-civilization or prehistoric civilization? And I believe this is what you know, uh, Niven had stumbled upon evidence of this in his um, in his excavations in in, uh, in and around Mexico City. Yeah, that must have been very thrilling, really. 
Yeah. Well, now let's move to one other area, the area that I think a lot of people are very interested in. What does your theory tell us about the pyramids at Giza and the Sphinx? Boy, things are really changing now. Yeah. So, um, and this is where it gets really weird because there's so much resistance to accepting the idea that the pyramids and Sphinx are pre-dynastic, that they're built many thousands of years ago, not, not uh, you know, four or 5,000 years ago, but, you know, much longer than that, based on patterns of water erosion and so forth. And, and, and just based on the, on the precision, the execution and the precision of the architecture, it's like it's mind-boggling that the earliest generation uh, of Egyptians, you know, uh, were that's had that level of technology. The interesting thing is that the pyramids uh, and the Sphinx basically follow a cardinal alignment pattern. They're, the pyramids are all aligned with uh, uncanny precision to the cardinal directions, very precise to north. And the Sphinx, as you know, points uh, due east. And uh, yeah, the uh, Robert Baval's uh, and Graham Hancock's Orion correlation theory is that this pattern on the ground matched that on the sky in the sky. Mm -hmm. Uh, circa, you know, 10,500 BC. Uh, and this is the, you know, you referenced uh, as above, uh, so below. Hermes uh, quote, as above, so below. Uh, probably the best example of that. So, so I, like I said, where this gets really weird is that archaeologists refuse to even wrap their brains around, around that date of 10,500 BC. Um, what you find in, in, Upper Egypt, so this is you know Luxor, um, up up the Nile River, so, so south, um, is something completely different. You find temples and structures that very few are aligned to the cardinal directions. Very few. Most are aligned in these weird directions that don't seem to correlate with anything. One theory is that they're lined up to sort of face in the direction of the Nile River. And of course, you find some correlations. Some things correlate, but others don't. It turns out that if you look at the alignments relative to prior poles in Upper Egypt, they match. They they the majority of them seem to reference in some way one of these prior pole locations that I've been talking about and talk about on the book. In Southern Egypt, it's exactly the opposite. The the, the vast majority of sites are aligned cardinally north, south, east, and west which suggests that the sites in Lower Egypt are much more recent, if you want to call, you know, 10,000 BC more recent than those in Upper Egypt, which could date back tens of thousands of years old. And um, it's, it's probably too, too hard to get into this, but there's, there's a whole, um, this now establishes a very interesting context for uh, now interpreting pa uh, Plato's uh, two dialogues, uh, Timaeus and uh, Critias, in terms of crustal displacement and pole shift theory, because his, his uh, number of, of sections uh, make, uh, can be taken quite literally, not as, as, uh, as allegory, as myth, but as, as factual statements about, about things um, back 10,000, you know, thousands of years ago. And um, you know, some of that is discussed in the book, some of it is on the website. Um, but Egypt was very interesting. And so why I say this gets really weird is the idea now uh, of, you know, even alternative archaeologists now, uh, you know, saying, OK, we we thought 10,500 B.C. is old. Now you're saying things are could be 100,000 years old. It's like, yeah. So now we're going back even another order of magnitude instead of looking at, you know, a couple thousand years, we're looking at tens of thousands of years or up to a hundred thousand years. So it's, it's getting uh, the implications of this work are really, um, are really significant and um, they're kind of, kind of hard to process. I wonder myself if it's true, but the, the weight of the, the number of sites that have been found um, just suggests that this can't be a, uh, you know, a statistical fluke of uh, just a, um, you know, just a random chance. There's mm -hmm. just hundreds of sites that, that seem to fit this pattern. Well, I'm, things have changed in Egypt so much uh, in the times that we had to spend. We had to 
set up a sister city relationship between Baltimore City and Luxor, Egypt, and Alexandria with our mayor, and fortunately, we had the support of Anwar El Sadat. And I had no idea, before we went to Egypt so many times, how much Anwar, Anwar Sadat was hated. Uh, mm. uh, and especially by certain people that were, in con well, I mean, Zahi Hawass. If you ever had to deal with Zahi Hawass, if, if it weren't for Sadat, we could have never gotten anywhere near the kind of things that we needed to do. He allowed yeah. us to spend the night, literally, in, the, in various tombs and things of that nature, which we did, could never have done with uh, uh, Hawass. Hawass, uh, I hope that someday they really put him in jail. Let me put it that way. <laughs> no, he deserves it. I mean, he stole things. He hid things. He, and, he, and he certainly frustrated so many individuals who were really uh, trying to look at Egypt in a different way, but he just would not let them. So but I, see, this, and, this, and this is, uh, you know, this is sort of runs counter to what you're talking about with Hapgood, his work being ignored and, and marginalized. It's, you know, why, why, why is this happening? It's because he's trying to upset an existing paradigm. And, you know, these alternative archaeologists, um, you know, uh, people like Boval and Hancock and West and so forth, um, are saying to the Egypt Egyptologists, no, you're wrong. Um, your, your ancestors did not build these. They were built by, by someone else. Mm -hmm. They don't want to hear this. No, of course not. And so they're going to turn, you know, there, there's even, there's a, uh, there's a site in Egypt, I think. It's a very old, very interesting uh, site that I think is being, uh, was turned into a garbage dump by the Egyptian military. Uh, I forget the name of the pyramid. It's in, the, it's in my book. Um, yes, it but is you in only, your book. I can't remember pardon? either. It is in your book because I remember reading it. And, I was... and, and you wonder, well, why are they doing this? Is it because there's some really uh, damning evidence that, hey, th th this pyramid is not, you know, a couple thousand years old, but it's it's way older than than than, you know, mm -hmm. our authorities say it is. And, so. and and of course, used for different things in the way the traditional Egyptology likes to take a look at what the was going on with the Great Pyramid, because uh, in the various societies and secret societies that I belong with, boy, it, it uh, is very, very important, the Great Pyramid and the kind of uh, rituals that go within that. I, I'm well, sure you've been inside there. And yes, so I was, and and you know, and you have uh, you have some backsheesh, and you can get in, and, uh, <laughs> and you can bucks, you can yeah. stay there a little bit. But you know, it's it the arrogance of the so-called experts is just, it's unbelievable because you know there's like no very very little in the way of written uh, any indication of what the pyramids were used for, um, and um, you know the they say that you know going uh, t turning from Egypt now back to Mesoamerica that the Spanish destroyed so much when they um, conquered Mexico. Um, there was really very little left. There were a few codices, but the native people that lived there had no idea of the origin of any of these structures. In fact, they were living in villages. They weren't even living in these grand temples, you know, in uh, Chichen Itza and, and uh, Tulum and, and all these other places. They were living in, in villages and uh, they knew nothing about the, the ruins, you know, uh, in their backyard. And, 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 and the Spanish destroyed, you know, whatever, uh, you know, much of probably what was known. And now in their arrogance, a lot of archeologists are saying, well, this temple was used for this and used for that. And, and it's the authoritativeness is one thing, but the fact that it, it has limited the time frame, uh, it, they, they've totally closed the door on anything being uh, even r remotely interesting in terms of, of, of ancient origins to like, you know, just, you know, a thousand years ago or 1500 years ago. But they're finding uh, these buried sites in the jungles in, in, uh, in, in the Yucatan, the Mayan uh, lowlands that, that are like, they're really scratching their head and they don't understand how they, how, early Mayans could have built some of these sites. So, Indeed, yeah. you know, it's, it's the arrogance that they hold on to these ideas. And I guess they hold on to them until the damning evidence, the, the smoking gun comes along. Unfortunately, uh, the work that, you know, I'm doing and others are doing, 
uh, you know, outsiders in a sense, uh, we're not part of the club, um, is, is sort of uh, you know, degraded or uh, marginalized. And then the fact that, you know, our arguments are largely circumstantial because, hey, we, we have not experienced a pole shift. If we do, then I think, you know, who's right about pole shifts will be uh, unimportant. I think we'll be more concerned with getting food and surviving. Um, and sure. so all this, whatever we knew would be forgotten. You know, Hancock talks about this in, in, um, in uh, America before about how following a disaster, right, you know, you kind of revert back to hunter-gatherers. You start all over that's again. That's right. And that's, uh, I'm afraid that that's where we're heading. But I, I know you don't believe that, but I do. So we're going to take a break here on 21st Century. Actually, this is our final break on 21st Century Radio. And when I come back, did I read somewhere that in your book, I thought I looked into the possibility that a form of liquid cement may have been the solution to how the Great Pyramid was built? We'll talk about that when we come back. This is Robert Boval. I'm the author of the Orion Mystery and Message of the Sphinx. And you're listening to 21st Century Radio with Dr. Bob Hieronymus as your host. May the quest go on. Yes, the quest has been going on for almost 40 years, friends. And it looks like we're going to be here another 50 years, but maybe not at this station. Welcome back to 21st Century Radio with our guest, Dr. Mark Carlotto. Before Atlantis, new evidence suggesting the existence of a previous technological civilization on Earth, published in 2018. And we got a deal for you. And the deal was basically this, and I'll make it fast. You purchase a copy of this book, and you can prove it to us. You will have your choice of any book that we have ever, ever uh, put on our show on 21st Century over the last several decades, and that's hundreds and hundreds of books. DVDs, you can choose anything you want, and we'll make sure you get it right away. So, do a good do a job on that. Are you with us, Mark? I'm here. Okay, Mark. Um, yes, the cement question. The cement question. Yeah, you talked about, you mentioned for uh, Giza, the Giza pyramids, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. I actually haven't heard of it for um, Egypt, but... That's a theory that uh, has been floating around uh, concerning the, um, I think they're called the H blocks at Tiwanaku. Um, well, I, actually, the guy that uh, I first started out with this years ago, uh, he was Dr. Joseph Davidovitz. And, mm -hmm. and from Dr. Joseph Davidovitz, now there's at least eight, ten other people right now saying the same thing. Uh, but I thought I saw it. I read it in your book today that you, uh, not your book. Yes, your book. Okay, but moving right along, yeah. I must be well, wrong. Well, I think I, the one thing I do, I do know, I, 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 I just in the description of the monoliths uh, at, um, at Oye Te, Te Tambo in, uh, in South America, in the, uh, in Peru's Sacred Valley, um, that, you know, a lot of these megalithic structures in South America seem to have stones that are so precisely uh, formed or, 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 or um, shaped that they believe that they were cast as opposed to being um, oh, that's quarried. Right. Mm -hmm. And that, that I, I, do, I do, do make reference to that, but I don't believe, I could be wrong, I don't think I mentioned uh, Egypt. You may have me on that one. Well, right now, there's another book on it right now called The Great Pyramid Secret, Egypt's Amazing Lost Mystery Science Returns. Well, enough of that, though. So, does your theory support Plato's myth of Atlantis? Yeah, I think, uh, uh, and there's uh, actually one of my posts at beforeatlantis.com that I sort of go through and do a little critique of his theory, uh, I'm sorry, of, of um, uh, Plato's uh, two dialogues. Um, with respect to sort of an assumption or a working hypothesis of pole shifts. And there's, um, I think I have it queued up here. Uh, there's a passage in Timaeus that seems to describe a pole shift in mythological terms. Uh, he says, um, there's a story which even you have preserved that once upon a time, uh, Phaeton, the son of Helios, having yoked the steeds of his father's chariot, because he was not able to drive them in the path of his father, 
burnt up all that was upon the earth and was himself destroyed by a thunderbolt. Now, this has the form of a myth, but really signifies a declination of the bodies moving in the heavens around the earth and a great conflagration of things upon the earth, which recurs after long intervals at such times those who live upon the mountains and in dry and lofty places are more likely to, to destruction than those that live uh, or dwell by the rivers or on the seashore. So there's, there's actually a lot. That's a re really long sentence um, or two. And uh, there's a lot in there. First of all, this idea of changes in the declinations of bodies moving in the heavens. When a pole shift occurs, that's exactly what would be observed if you looked up the sun would no longer rise in what was the east. If the poles rotated 90 degrees uh, clockwise, the sun would be, ro uh, would be rising in what was, uh, if it was, you know, the first day of spring, suddenly now the sun would be rising due, you know, due north and setting due south in, in terms of the old directions. So th in terms of the geometry of what would be observed, it matches the, the language in, in, uh, in, in, in uh, that part of the dialogue perfectly. And then he talks about uh, where you live and whether you survive the cataclysm or you don't. And this actually fits in really well with the idea that with a pole shift, there would be floods and earthquakes and other, other disasters. And if you look at uh, Greece and say Egypt, Egypt had a much more uh, upper Egypt was much more protected from, from a cataclysm. It was far from the ocean, far from earthquake fault lines. This I talk about in the book. Whereas Greece and lower Egypt would have probably, probably have been destroyed um, by the cataclysm, by the floods. Um, and, um, and certainly in, you know, in, in uh, Europe um, by the earthquakes. And so there's, there's a number of other pas passages. I won't go through all of them, but um, uh, there's, uh, there's, a, I kind of see uh, myth as being like the breadcrumbs. You know, they don't tell you exactly how to get somewhere, but they're really good clues. And I think with, you know, together with scientific methods, the two can really help us, you know, reconstruct these these older or these lost civilizations. So there's other stuff in here I won't get into. Talks about um, implications about an earlier. Uh, a, a, an antediluvian civilization in, in Europe, um, which, you know, you never hear about that. Who's talked about an ancient civilization before the Greeks in Europe? Um, but uh, there's, there's evidence that supports that as well in, in, uh, in his dialogues. And I talk about that in this article. So there's, there's a lot. What I'm doing now is, is uh, just kind of spreading out and finding more and more support of theory, more sites, more alignments, more myths, uh, more um, lost civilizations that, or, or beginnings of modern day civilizations that don't have a, you know, really good explanation. Well, why, why did, um, you know, why did the, cent the civilization in Central Asia suddenly spring up, you know, at the edge of the desert of all places? Well, because yeah. you know, there wasn't a desert there 20,000 years ago. Uh, so anyway, yeah. well, there's a lot. There's uh, I want to the last question I have here is about UFOs. Finally, tell us about this recent video showing UFOs flying around the moon. <laughs> in uh, so in before Atlantis, I'm really clear up front. It's like I don't want to. I want I want to try a different strategy and not you know assume that there are extraterrestrials and that you know the the whole ancient astronaut theory. Uh, von Donegan's uh, approach. I wanted to try something completely different. And before Atlantis is actually not based on UFOs or anything like that. It's based on, hey, was there an earlier migration out of Africa, Australia, wherever, where that civilization could have arose and, uh, arisen uh, sooner, uh, earlier on Earth in an earlier cycle. So anyways, having said that, I kind of have, you know, the split brain thing. The other side of my brain is still open to UFOs. And I analyzed a video taken by a French astronomer. Uh, it's posted, uh, there's an article uh, at thefortlantis.com, and it's really striking. This video shows three objects flying around the moon, and they're enormous, and they're moving at enormous, uh, at, at tremendous speeds. 
And this reminded me of the analysis I did of the space shuttle video back in the 90s that showed objects. They weren't nearly the size, uh, but they were moving this fast uh, around uh, the Earth, uh, photographed by the space shuttle, the STS-48 and later STS-80. So, you know, I, I still, this is a, it's kind of a, a part of the puzzle. You know, I think everything has to sort of fit in the, the equation has to balance out. Everything's got to be accounted for. I still haven't figured out UFOs. It, it's hard. They're hard to study because we're obviously not in control of the phenomenon. We can't perform an experiment on them. We have to kind of take whatever data we have. And is it legit or has it been falsified? Is it synthesized? Has someone, you know, generated some fake photos? You know, that's what ufology is about. It's about determining it is, you know, is a photo real or fake. But the, in terms of the physics, very little you can do. But this video does actually allow some analysis, and I talk about that. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, it's pretty interesting stuff. It's the most uh, interesting video I've seen in a while. Have you ever heard about the theory that the moon is hollow? I know that you probably know that, that NASA knows about one time when something struck uh, the moon, at, at that bell that rang on sounded yeah. for at least, uh, I don't know, hours or whatever. Yeah, you know, I, 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 I've heard of it. Um, what, what's interesting, though, is that they're finding right now there's a lot of interest in these uh, features on the moon called um, called uh, skylights or, um, oh, yeah. oh, God, there's a couple of different names for them. But they're, they're, uh, they're, they're caves. You know, the, the lava tubes, there's lava tubes all over the moon, and they're, they're, they're tunnels. Mm -hmm. And some of them open up, and so you have an opening into this underground cavity that can be enormous and they think they're all over the moon and in the you know there's some on mars too and that's where they're thinking would be you know good places for setting up uh you know bases underground and so i mean that's about as close as i can come to a hollow moon theory i think mm -hmm. there's underground spaces on the moon and there there there's uh what they call transient lunar phenomenon that seem to be correlated with where these these uh these features are located which might have whether they're natural or man-made, we don't, or alien, we don't really know. Um, so, yeah, it's it's fascinating stuff. I don't know. That's well, a whole other discussion. Well, it <laughs> cer certainly is, and and uh, I've, there are other different theories about it. But but I I, I remember. Uh, well, I don't. I, I'm not going to move in that direction anymore. But I want to close with a little bit about uh, our our dear mutual friend here that we're that I focused on here. Do you know who that is? Uh, d uh, Professor Hapgood. You have just won a free trip to Bermuda and a carton <laughs> of Cokes. Hey, do you remember the days <laughs> on radio <laughs> when you could win a carton of Cokes, which would cost you about a, a dollar and a half, uh, as a big prize? And it was a big thing uh, yeah. in the old yeah. days. Um, yeah. But, you know, when I look at his faith of a scientist, I cry sometimes because I think, my gosh, like a scientist must have not be afraid of the imagination, but let it lead him to new fields of thought. A scientist must know that beyond the five sentences, beyond the parameters of mass, physical energy, space, and time, there exist deeper orders of reality for the physical world is, is the only one of many modes of being. He also says that a scientist must know that man's life is not the byproduct of a physical organism, but stems from a deeper reality for every man. Now, these are the kind of things when he would get together with our, our, our my friends, these are the kind of things he wanted to talk about because he felt that they were more important than even his books. Uh, and I've uh, always felt very poor, poorly about how he was treated by a number of uh, even my friends uh, concerning it because they didn't necessarily want to believe any of this. Well, again, I thank you for that for that article because it, it's given me a, a, some new insights into Hapgood. And, you know, I, and it's uh, just really sweet to see that he sh shared the same deep sort of spiritual uh, almost uh, foundations that Einstein and other yes. great scientists uh, have. Yeah. Yes. That he was closed in that way. I want to yeah. thank you for joining us, Mark, and we're going to be bothering you again in the future. Uh, and please stay in touch with us. It's been not 20 years is a long time. 
Yeah, I know. I was busy doing other things. We could talk about that sometime, maybe, huh? Okay. Yes. <laughs> Have a good evening. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. And everyone else, we'll see you next week. So we'll see you next week on 21stCenturyRadio.com. Thank you.